Hello everyone. It is 2.15 in the morning and my battery on my phone is dying. I've tried to make this video many, many times and I've been sick, so most of those attempts have ended in me having a coughing fit and realizing that my voice sounded quite horrible and I should probably quit while I was ahead. I've been working on this one for weeks and part of the reason that it's taken me so long is that I'm very cautious about the subject matter. I am afraid that people will misinterpret what I have to say. I'm going to be talking about how I've been living with autoandrophilia, which is not necessarily transgender, but it is the sexual attraction to being of the opposite gender. So as a as a woman, I'm sexually attracted to being a man. But more generally, just I wish I could be a man. Does it have its fundamental roots in sexuality? Well, there's there's some evidence to suggest that fundamentally it's a sexual thing, but it also works its way into all the other areas of your life. And for a very long time, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know why I had all these feelings. I didn't know what to do with these feelings. And so they frequently made me feel very awkward because I didn't know what was going on. And then eventually I discovered the concept of autoandrophilia. And after being quite horrified by it because I thought, oh God, does that make me a pervert? I learned more about it and kind of came to a place where I was like, okay, this is part of my life and so my goal at that point was to integrate all these little random confusing pieces of myself more fully into who I am. If you read any Jung, and God knows I need to read some Jung but I haven't, there's a lot of stuff about integrating the shadow and all that. That's that's what I'm talking about. There were all these little shadowy bits to me. I didn't really know what they were. I didn't have any way of making sense of them and now that I can put a label on them I can identify them, I can categorize them, and I can say, okay, all this stuff that I have going on in the very back of my head that I don't have a place for, or really an understanding of, I can start to integrate that into who I am and how I interpret myself as a human being in this world, and how I interact with the world around me. And personally, I think that's very healthy. I understand a lot of people, ah, TERFs, I'm not, I, I have strong reservations when it comes to anything feminism related because I'm not a fan of feminism so I'm automatically a little bit biased against TERFs but I, I they do make some good arguments I just I have my issues I have my own personal issues um, I'm probably never gonna be a TERF because I don't think I'll ever get along with the feminist element of TERFdom but I've seen enough TERFs who've looked at it and said well usually they're talking about autogynophiles because feminists don't like penises it's it's almost a baseline rule. If you're a feminist, you probably have some prejudices against penis-bearing members of the population. And so, naturally, as an autoandrophile, that's, that doesn't fit well with me. Um, but uh, I, I've seen TERFs who've looked at it and said, autogynophiles are just perverts. That's all it is. It's just perversion. And I've had people call me a pervert on here, um, which I does not sting as badly as I expected it to. Um, by the time finally I started encountering people who told me I was a pervert, it was like, well, what do you actually know? Um, but initially I was very, very anxious about that. And I even, in my first videos about autogynophilia, autoandrophilia, um, I was very anxious about it. It was like, you know, am I a pervert? I don't know. I, I'm creeped out by this. At this point, it's like, no, I'm not a pervert. I'm, I'm me this is who I am. I'm not getting my rocks off when I go out and hang out with my male friends. I'm having a great time hanging out with my male friends because I enjoy their companionship. I'm not like perving on these guys that I hang out with. We're just hanging out and I'm really happy because I enjoy their company. So there's a million and one ways that I have tendencies that are at their at their core autoandrophilic that are not necessarily sexual or sexual feeling to me. They're just a part of my personality. And so integrating those into my life is, you know, kind of important. And God forbid I should do the opposite, which would be to look at them and say, oh no, because it's rooted in sex, I have to take every little teeny one of these pieces out of me and, and, and shove them off into a corner and hide away from them. And that kind of gets back to the root of why I'm so cautious about this subject matter, because I really do think people are going to look at it and say, oh, 
she doesn't want to transition and she's not necessarily advocating for transition, which means she must be advocating for conversion therapy. And that could not be farther from the truth. I do, I do expect some people to intentionally misinterpret the things I say because that's just kind of the rule for the internet, not the exception. But, oh dear, my toddler is crying. It's 2.15. Yep, I need to get him a glass of water. Okay, I'm back. Many of the attempts that I've made to make this video, because I've made this, I've tried many times to make this video, many of those attempts have gotten sidetracked because I get off on a tangent about how strongly I feel about conversion therapy. Um, I am deeply opposed to it, and I've come to the realization that that's going to have to be its own separate video. I could talk about that forever, and uh, that's not what this video is about. I am not advocating for conversion therapy. It should be that simple. If you are listening to what I'm saying and you're interpreting it as, oh, she's talking about conversion therapy, that is not what I am trying to do. Even if maybe that's what you're thinking it sounds like, that is not. And I don't know what else to tell you. Like, it, it's just not. That being said, transition is not a good solution for every person. There are plenty of people out there in the world for whom transition just, for many different reasons, doesn't work, and I am one of those individuals. I do not believe it would be good for my health, and I I just, it, it, I don't think it would work for me. It wouldn't work for my family, it wouldn't work for my husband, who's a heterosexual man, it wouldn't work for my kids. I just don't think it's a good idea on, on so many different levels in my life. And so I'm not going to try and do that. I, I honestly don't think that it would help me feel any more fulfilled as an individual because I realize that I'm autoandrophilic and so it's like what exactly would I be getting out of transition that I can't obtain through other means and uh, the answer that I keep coming up with is not a whole heck of a lot I don't think for me I, I think a better route for me personally and I'm not saying that everybody should do this, I'm saying for me personally as an individual, incorporating those autoandrophilic parts of myself into my day-to-day -day life and, and just becoming a more complete person and a more integrated person, I think that's the route that I want to take and I think that's the route that I'm going to find most fulfilling and most satisfying and so that's what I'm doing. And so the first thing I do, which obviously I can't at this point in time because I'm very pregnant, is I exercise a lot. I stay very, very toned. Um, I try to keep myself in the very best of health that I possibly can. I can't do a lot of that right now. I can't make myself feel physically strong or healthy. Um, I can't work on my flexibility. I can't do much of anything with my body right now. I'm, I'm fat. I'm pregnant. I get tired extremely easily. I'm sick on top of all that. It's not happening for me. Um, even the even the little teeny basic things that I do are just absolutely exhausting and that's just that's just pregnancy. I spend most of my pregnancies trying not to think about what's happening to my body because when I look in a mirror it's just depressing. And I understand that it's a temporary situation and so I don't worry about it until after the pregnancy is over and then I look at myself and say, okay, I'm going to invest myself now in <laughs> I, in, in, interestingly enough, in transforming my physical appearance because I'm not fond of what I look like right now. I look like I'm a huge, giant, walking jello person. And I'm going to make myself into a physical form that I find much more pleasant. That's going to be a project for me in a few months after the baby is born. Until then, I'm just going to have to not think about my body as much as I possibly can, and so I'm not thinking about my body. And I'm going through my days trying really hard not to think about my body. I don't know if other pregnant women do this or if it's just a unique me thing, but this is what I've been doing. It's not what I want to make the video about, though. The thing I wanted to make the video about was something else I've been doing, something new that has been helping me a lot. And this is the point at which I start to think people are going to be like, oh, conversion therapy, here we go. Um, religion, interestingly enough. Spirituality and religion. 
and how those have been playing a role in me, in my personal journey of integrating my autoandrophilia more fully into my life. Now, I've had a lot of people message me and tell me that finding Jesus is going to make my life better. I grew up in a really conservative Christian area of the country and it just did not work for me at all. It was the most off-putting thing. I encountered rampant hypocrisy in the churches that I attended growing up and it really put me off of Christianity. And so all the way up into adulthood, there I came to a point where I was like, I just can't be a Christian. Like, I love a lot of Christian values, there's a lot of good stuff in Christianity, but when it comes to the practice and not the theory, there's so much hypocrisy, I cannot stand this particular religion any longer. And so I left the church. And then when I met my husband, who was Catholic, I decided to try to be a good Christian because Catholicism is a very different brand than some of the bouncing up and down born-again Christian varieties that I encountered growing up. And it's like, okay, I can, I can do this. I can do this. And it was, I, before, before I got married to my husband, I converted over to Catholicism. I took classes, I attended lectures, I went through ceremonies, I became a Catholic, um, an official Catholic in the church. And my kids are being raised Catholic right now, my husband is still Catholic. It was all good and well, it was, it was very difficult for me to do that. Um, every step of the way it felt like I was pulling teeth. Um, I remember at one point I got so upset about it that I told my husband I just didn't want to go through it with it anymore, at which point he got kind of annoyed because he'd been working really hard to help me get through it. Um, but I mean, I got through it, and I spent several years being a Catholic, and I noticed over the course of those years that I kind of just avoided religion as a Catholic, and that was something that I had noticed when I was growing up in my conservative, born-again Christian environment. Uh, my parents, by the way, were not born-again Christians, they were Episcopalians, so it was very different. Like, I had my family's church beliefs and those I could stomach, and then I would go out into the world and be told that I was going to go to hell because I didn't believe in Christianity and do Christianity the way that other people around me did Christianity, and so I must be doing it wrong. Um, which was also rather off-putting, but I realized that I just, I, I wasn't being Christian. I realized that I was Christian in name only. Like I had, I had converted and so it was official. It was in the paperwork and everything. I, w I was going through the necessary steps, but I wasn't practicing Christianity. And I can't remember at the moment, uh, offhand, if that's what finally made me decide you just can't be Christian anymore. Is Christianity a religion that is giving me any kind of spiritual fortitude? No. Is Christianity a religion that I find myself gravitating toward when things are bad? No. Is Christianity a religion that I find myself gravitating toward when things are good? No. Does, do, do I have any kind of real spiritual ties to this religion, or am I just doing it because I think that's the right thing to do? And the truth is, I'd, I'd been jumping through hoops to fit into this religion that I didn't feel any strong sense of spiritual connection with. And so, you know, I think that's the point at which I just kind of I gave up on it. It was like, this isn't working for me. And so this was the second time that I gave up on Christianity. And it wasn't nearly as difficult as the first time. Um, but I remember the first time I gave up on Christianity, I looked at it and it was like, you know, I don't know how God feels about the religion that I'm going over to. But I do know that if I'm not growing spiritually and if I'm not practicing spiritually, then I'm not deepening my relationship with God by being in the good religion. And so I'm honestly, I think, better off going to the bad religion, whatever that is, 
um, and practicing and being a good practitioner of that religious school of thought, I think I'm going to be more successful building up a spiritual relationship with God or the divine or whatever. I'm going to do a better job in a less ideal religion than I'm doing in a presumably good religion that I can't really make myself follow very well. And so I went over to Wicca, and I'm, I'm back at Wicca again. Wicca is a funny religion because, as many people have pointed out, it was founded by a dirty old man who wanted to see women naked. I'm not going to deny that. I'm not going to, uh, to make any kind of argument against that because it's absolutely true. No religion is perfect, and this one is definitely not an exception to that rule. Wicca is... Wicca, I do not... I, I'm not attracted to Wicca for the reason I think a lot of people are attracted to Wicca. And I could make multiple hours of videos about Wiccan thought and Wiccan philosophy, and I might actually eventually do that, but right now I'm trying to keep it on the trans subject. Um, when I went over to Wicca, the way I do Wicca is not necessarily going to be the way other people do Wicca. I'm not a part of a coven, I'm a solitary practitioner, and I think that that's a good thing because I think sometimes people get into Wicca and they have all sorts of weird ideas about how Wicca should work, and they're just not that healthy about it. And I think that that happens in any religion. I honestly think that Christianity is one of those religions where there's less pathology in the group than some of the other religions that are out there because I think that when you get enough Wiccans together, frequently you end up with a lot of pathology. I could be wrong, but that's just my, that's my internal bias. I stay by myself. I'm a solitary practitioner. And the thing about Wicca that's so attractive to me is that it's a very, very open-ended. There aren't many rules in Wicca, and so it gives a person a lot of freedom. And you can use that freedom in good ways and you can use that freedom in bad ways. There are a lot of people who take that freedom and say, I can do whatever I want, ha ha ha. Um, there are a lot of people who take that freedom and they think they're doing the right thing, but they end up doing some pretty messed up things. And it's because they don't have the foresight to really imagine the consequences of their actions or to fully grasp the consequences of their actions. And so I've taken a lot of Christian ideas with me into Wicca, which as a solitary practitioner I'm perfectly allowed to do. Because Wicca is Wicca, there's no rule that says that I can't have as many Christian elements in my Wiccan practice as I want to. If I want to do it, I can do it. And the reason that that's so attractive to me is because Wicca allows me like, forgetting all the magic stuff, because people are like, well, what about magic? I don't care about magic. I care about conceptualizing God in a way that I can relate to God. Or, you know, that which is holy, or that which is divine, or that which is sacred. Whatever you want to call it. I don't, I don't really care. For me, it's about building and deepening that relationship with the divine and, you know, perhaps even serving the divine in some way. And so I have an altar because altars are big in Wicca. <laughs> and I've taken my altar and I've divided it into sections. And these different sections kind of help to physically embody a framework of ideas so that I can have everything laid out in front of me like a, like an idea board or, or you know, a brainstorming board or whatever. Um, and I can really look and meditate on these different ideas and concepts of God and what is holy and what is divine. And you might be sitting there thinking, okay, the more you talk about God and holiness and divineness, you really are sounding like you're advocating for conversion therapy. Please bear with me. I'm really not. Because I have that open-endedness, because I have that space to work on my interpretation of spirituality. You know, it gives me a lot of freedom to filter through ideas and come to a deeper understanding of concepts that 
honestly, one of the things I struggled with with a lot of the Christianity back home, you know, small town, born again, jump up and down, praise Jesus, um, you weren't allowed to ask questions. There was a certain cult-like element to it where it's like, you can't be too open-minded, you can't ask too many questions, you have to take everything on faith. Well, what is faith? You have to take that on faith. Okay, you're not allowed to ask questions. And that doesn't work for me because all I do is sit around asking questions all day. So clearly I didn't fit in very well there. But when everything is open-ended, you can take concepts, you can take God figures, and you can use them as placeholders for elements of what you understand to be sacred. And in doing so, it kind of gives you more of a structure around which to pin different ideas of what is sacred and what isn't. And I'm, I'm getting kind of vague and abstract here, so let me describe my altar to you. I have three different shelves, and each shelf has a different level of conceptualizing God, for lack of a better term, the holy, the divine, what have you. Top shelf is the extremely abstract spiritual, and that's the very vague, the very inaccessible, the very mysterious elements of divinity. And I keep my tarot cards there. Uh, there's a few other items. It's a very special shelf, but it's also not a very relatable shelf. It's the, it's the mysterious and unrelatable elements of that which is divine. And it brings me back to, I've talked about this in one of my videos, long story short, I encountered God. And it was an amazing experience and uh, a miraculous experience. And like I said, I didn't take drugs. And so I was very mystified as to how it was happening. And I remember trying to figure out, well, is there any way that I could have ingested a drug at some point in my day and it's like well no because you haven't eaten anything and you haven't drunk anything and you know you haven't accidentally poked yourself with any random needles that were lying around like you, there, you, this is not this is not a, an external chemical process um took me a while to sort through all that but the experience was oops please don't let my battery go out i'm almost done the experience was absolutely miraculous and i could go on about that for hours that is what that shelf is kind of a placeholder for. God is vast and mysterious and, at least in my experience, amorphous. Now, I always believed that God would be amorphous, and I honestly think that when God comes to people, frequently God appears to people in a form that they're going to recognize. And so it makes sense that what I encountered was a sentient ball of light. Because that's what I always believed God would look like. So it made perfect sense to me that God would look like that. Uh, for other people, it's probably not like that. But it was quite miraculous, and it was definitely life-changing. And there was a mysterious element to it where it's like, this is a thing that is so much bigger than I am, and so far beyond my comprehension. And so, the mysterious element of the divine, the unknowable, the intangible, gets its own, gets its own shelf on my altar. The shelf directly below that is slightly more rooted in physicality, and that actually has um, a Christian symbol. It's a statue of uh, Mary holding the baby Jesus and Joseph, and they're all a family, they're all together. And that is, it's one of the pieces of Christianity that I held on to. There was so much emphasis when I was growing up on the crucifixion, he died for our sins, you have to repent, you have to feel bad, you have to pick through your life and every little thing that you've done wrong and feel all sorts of ways about it. There's so much emphasis on apologizing for all the little teeny things that you don't do perfectly well and I just got so fed up with it and the performative nature of it of of you know people 
dramatically weeping in the church and crying out that they had been they're such terrible sinners and then you know five minutes later they go back to doing exactly the same thing they were just weeping about five minutes ago it's like you're that damn sorry about it then why do you just keep doing it all the time i hate to be so jaded about it because there's some wonderful christians in the world but i i didn't have the best experience but you know Mary, the baby Jesus, the family unit of, of her, Joseph, and the baby Jesus, that was something that I looked at, and it's like, this is actually very sacred. It's one of the pieces of Christianity that I took with me, and so naturally it's going to have a place of honor. It's going to take the second shelf underneath the mysterious and purely divine, but also very difficult to understand elements of God, and then there's a shelf below that one, and that's where things get kind of interesting. This shelf is the shelf where I have more minor deities. And so Wicca has deities, plural. It's a, it's a polytheistic religion. And I have a representation of the goddess. And I have a representation of a god. And I have all sorts of little random knickknacks too. Because Wiccan altars, they just attract knickknacks. They're, they're perfect for knickknacks. And so I've got... Um, offering bowls to these gods where I do leave little teeny offerings because it's not a very big shelf so they're tiny offering bowls and I've got a star-shaped um, incense holder that burns incense and I've got like little little things here and there to decorate the altar and to just make it into a pleasant and serene place where I can go to meditate and calm myself and think spiritual thoughts all oh, that's a little good and well, but I have, for certain, a representation of a god and a representation of a goddess, and so you have fundamental, very base, very earthly representations of how divinity threads its way down from the mysterious to the fundamentally holy elements of humanity, uh, which would be, you know, more Christian in my own understanding of the world because that's what I've seen as being holy for much of my life to the very very baseline male and female elements and these are parts of humanity they're fundamental to humanity and so they're still sacred to humanity but they're much more earthly and much more grounded and much more physical and so they would be on the lowest shelf but that's also the shelf that's closest to eye level because that's where I am I'm human and so I'm kind of stuck in a very physical framework and so that's that's kind of how I've got my altar all laid out um, it's not the typical Wiccan altar where you've got your candle to the north and then your candle to the south and you got your little bowl of water and all your crap I I had that when I first started with Wicca but then you know as time passed I became more and more abstract about it and this is what I've come up with how this all feeds into my autoandrophilia is because I have a male deity and a female deity, my task that I assigned myself when I was laying out this altar, and I thought this was very important because I realized I was autoandrophilic, and it was like, I don't know what to do with this, and so it's like, take it to the altar, stick it into the framework, see how it fits, is to acknowledge and celebrate the masculine elements of my life as they apply to the god, and the feminine elements of my life as well. And so to to give praise to that which is holy, even if it's the most base parts of holiness and the base parts of, of what's sacred about humanity, they're still holy. To give prayers to the male elements of the deity when I find myself exhibiting or living out more autoandrophilic elements of my life, even if they are just stereotypes, to acknowledge and to embrace those parts of myself and to to do that in my prayers and in my offerings as well so that there's a very physical very real very um, mindful element to it for me mindfulness is big I'm not so huge on the magic I don't really believe in magic I'm uh, I never pretended to be a good Wiccan but at the same time I think I'm better as a Wiccan than I was as a Christian <laughs> but that helps me to in incorporate that autoandrophilic element of myself into my life more fully to to embrace the masculine elements of myself 
because those elements exist. In all human beings, male or female, there are going to be masculine elements and there are going to be feminine elements. And so acknowledging, embracing, and really incorporating those masculine elements into myself in a very mindful and conscious way you know that 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 was the exciting part that was the fun part of the assignment i was like okay i i can definitely get behind this i think this is going to be fun and it has been fun it's been very nice but then there's also a female a goddess figure on the altar and I found it much more challenging to celebrate the feminine elements of myself when I started out. Because it's like I've got all these negative feelings about femininity, I've got all these negative biases against femininity. I have, I'm sure, a lot of internalized misogyny that I just haven't addressed, that I haven't wanted to address, and I get very defensive about it because people dismiss the things that I have to say, which are very legitimate and real observations, as, oh, you're just being misogynistic. So you don't have to listen to what I have to say. You don't have to listen to my complaints and concerns because it's so much easier to ignore me and say, oh, well, she's just misogynistic, so she doesn't, whatever she has to say doesn't really count. It's very annoying when people do that. And so it makes me just kind of naturally not want to address my own very real, very genuine internalized misogyny. And so for a while, you know, I would... I would leave offerings to the goddess and I would try to do things that were, you know, pleasing to the goddess on a very technical level. So um, this specific goddess is Bastet because obviously there's a lot of cats in my life. And, um, you know, that seems like a pretty good goddess, you know, goddess of the hearth, goddess of the family, goddess of the household, um, very domestic kind of goddess. It's like, well, I mean, look at my life. That applies well to me, doesn't it? Bastet makes for a good baseline, earthy goddess figure to have on my altar. And so I did a bunch of research into Bastet, and I started bringing perfumes to her because perfume is big with Bastets. And I kind of looked back at the the dancing that I did as an exotic dancer, and I was like, well, you know, honestly, she would have loved that. So, I mean, we're, we're good there. And I tried to think of the things about me that were feminine, that fit with this goddess uh, figure with her lore and her mythology. And, you know, to try and find which of those things I could actually really embrace within myself and not resent because it's very easy for me to resent my femininity. It's very easy for me to look at my my physical female role in society and my physical female body within society and have a lot of very negative feelings about that part of my life. You know, I, I did I, I did a bunch of red pill videos, I did a bunch of manosphere videos. There's definitely some very good talking points within the manosphere, within the red pill community. I think there's some very legitimate complaints within the men's rights movement, but I swear to God, whichever God you want to believe in, it got so damn annoying trying to talk with a bunch of men who immediately always reverted back to the same finger-pointing argument, well, you're a woman, so I shouldn't have to give a shit what you have to say. What the fuck, man? If you want to be an ignorant ass, go be an ignorant ass, but don't expect to get any better, don't expect anything to improve, and by all means, don't expect to learn anything. It was extraordinarily frustrating, especially going through what I went through where my husband had a brain tumor for half a decade, and his health just went down the toilet and our marriage kind of went down the toilet right there with it and I was struggling a lot and I need to make a video about that because that's its whole own subject I could spend hours I'm not going to I went through all this difficulty and then I would have all these men scolding me online for all the crimes of every woman who's ever walked this earth and I'm sitting there going, okay, I'm doing all the things that you complain that women never actually do. I'm doing all the noble shit that you say, oh, well, women never do that. I'm actually doing it. And that's not good enough for you. And the reason it's not good enough for you is because 
I still have a vagina and I can't fix that or change it. Because I try not to think like a woman. I try not to act like a woman. I try not to be the stereotype of a woman. I don't want to be that thing. And I can't change the fact that I am still psychologically 100% female. Because I've, I've studied it. I've read up on it. I know what women are prone to be doing. I know what women are more likely to think and feel as opposed to men. And I can't change the fact that I'm a woman on a very, very fundamental level. Probably one of the reasons I just don't see much point in transitioning. It would be a disguise, but I, it would never be true. At least for me, it, it would never feel true. And so I have all this resentment of, of femininity. I, I, I struggle with it so much because society is constantly shoving me into this woman category that I don't think I fit into very well and, and, and telling me that I need to stay there and shaking a finger at me. And at the same time, I don't fit well into the woman category. So then there's all this awkwardness because I'm supposed to be doing woman things and liking them, but I, I can't seem to do that particularly well. And it's it's just layers upon layers of discomfort and awkwardness for me. And for those of you who are kind of apl applying the, the turf interpretation of, well, it's all a fetish, um, if it was all a fetish, it wouldn't be so messy in my life because it would all be sexual. And be like, well, I want this and I get horny over this, so there you go. It's not that simple. It's not that easy to work with. So I have all this resentment of my own femininity that I have to work through. And that was one of the things that I noticed as I go through this process of, you know, trying to trying to honor the goddess. Because I'm honoring the god, it, it would only be fair of me to honor the goddess as well. That's only, it, these are deities, it's only just. And so I'm trying to do, trying to do right by my religion. I'm trying to honor both deities. And so I'm doing a lot of technical stuff, you know, leaving perfume. I don't actually like perfume, but I'm, I'm leaving perfume for the goddess. And I'm trying to think of things that the goddess would enjoy, and I'm definitely having a much more fun leaving offerings for the god, but I'm trying to include the goddess in all this too. And every once in a while, I notice myself doing something stereotypically feminine that I don't actually resent. And so one of those things is playing around with my hair. Very feminine activity. I could spend hours and hours and hours researching different things I could do with my hair or trying out new hairstyles or playing with new things with my hair. I love playing around with my hair. I understand there are probably a lot of people who've looked at some of the strange things I've done with my hair lately and thinking, um, oh, she's doing this to look more masculine. And it's like, no, 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 no. I'm doing this because I enjoy playing with different hairstyles. And the concept of having parts of my head shaved while other parts of my hair grow quite long is so radical and it's such a an open-ended and creative thing that I can play with you know which parts get shaved how much gets shaved how how short do you shave it how long does the rest of it grow and how thick does the rest of it look after you've styled it when half of your hair is missing all of these are questions that I have to explore and so I play with my hair a lot and that's such a feminine thing the hairstyles themselves might not necessarily be particularly feminine but the activity that is stereotypically feminine and I realized that that was something that I could relate to the feminine side of myself with. So, of course, I take it to the altar. I, I give prayers to the goddess. I make a couple offerings, and I'm like, this is, this is good. This is a way to connect with my femininity that isn't filled with resentment. I don't have a lot of negative feelings or emotions about it. This is something that I can just enjoy about me. And that's healthy and that's good. This is something I can celebrate. This is something I can be happy about. This is something that I can embrace that's feminine about me. And the more I've gone through all these things about myself that are both feminine and masculine, because all human beings have feminine and masculine elements, I can see very easily how some people might do this activity and find themselves just 
hating their biological gender more and more and more. It's like, oh, you know, I did this and it's a feminine stereotype and I hate it so much. And it's like, that's not the activity. That's not doing the activity correctly. Uh, and that's not what I set out to do. What I set out to do was to find and identify both the masculine and feminine elements of my personality and to more lovingly embrace and accept those parts of myself. Because I'm not a wholly feminine individual and I'm not a wholly masculine individual. I'm a human being. And so for me, because I have this deep affinity for my masculine side, I want to embrace that. I want to welcome that in my life. And I want to acknowledge and incorporate that into myself. But I also don't want to have a resentment or, you know, for lack of a better word, dysphoria about my feminine side. I want to embrace that and accept that part of my life as well. And so I have these two statues and I go and I sit in front of my altar and I meditate and I think about my femininity. I think about things about me that are feminine that I don't have this natural automatic knee-jerk distaste for. And I also think about things about me that are masculine, that are very just natural to who I am as a person. And that makes me very happy. And I find myself in this process experiencing a lot of self-acceptance. Which is kind of ironic because I hear a lot about self-acceptance and I hear a lot about just acceptance in general. You need to be accepting. You need to be accepting. Um, I think there is in the trans community a certain undercurrent, and it's not in every individual, but there is a very strong undercurrent of self-dislike. There are many, many people in the trans community, not autogynophiles or autoandrophiles, but people in the trans community who are gay, who do not accept that part of themselves and would rather transition than face that part of themselves. I haven't explored that concept as much as other people have. I've seen some TERFs online. Obviously, TERFs, I don't always get along well with TERFs because they are feminists and I have some real strong feelings about feminists um, that aren't necessarily, I have biases. I definitely have my biases. I'm not even going to try and pretend otherwise. Uh, better to just be honest about it. I have biases that might or might not be fair. Uh, or even remotely reasonable. But I have seen some TERFs who are lesbians who've kind of pointed out that many, many trans people have a lot of internalized homophobia. And as much as we talk about acceptance in the trans community, you have to accept us. You have to accept us. Do we accept ourselves? Do we embrace ourselves? Do we know ourselves? And do we acknowledge and accept and love the people that we are as fundamental beings? And so that's the interesting thing that I've been doing lately that's really been helping me to incorporate my autoandrophilic tendencies into my life in a way that feels very healthy and very natural. Obviously, most people aren't Wiccan, and so <laughs> I'm not recommending that if you suspect you're autoandrophilic or autogynophilic, you should convert over to Wicca and build an altar. That's what I did, and that's what helped me. But for me, the Wiccan altar is a tool for understanding my own spirituality, my own human nature, and how that interacts with the greater overarching divinity. Because it all kind of threads back upward to God and to what is divine. It's all loosely interconnected. And so... For me, Wicca is just 
religion, honestly. Religion, for me, is a tool for building a stronger relationship with God. And Wicca is a really excellent tool for me because I'm such an ADHD, abstract-minded, kind of hectic, crazy sort of person that having a concept board like an altar really helps me to focus my meditations and my spiritual thinking. I'm not saying that that's going to work for everybody. You can just you can just skip the Wicca and skip the religion and be an atheist if you want to and have a concept board. You know, have a have a have a, a place where you go to just think and meditate. Um and I don't mean meditate in any specifically advocated, you know, you have to take four breaths in and five breaths out and you have to count to 30 and whatever other weird things people do with meditation. I just mean sit and think. Have a sitting thinking spot. A thinking spot is a really great thing to have. Think about the pieces of yourself that are masculine that you love and the pieces of yourself that are feminine that you love. And if you're anything like me, one of those things is going to be easier to do than the other. For me, it was very difficult to find the parts of myself that were feminine that I loved, and I was very patient with it. I didn't force the issue. I just kind of tried to catch them when I noticed them and acknowledge them. Like, oh, hey, I spend a lot of time playing with my hair. Well, that's a very feminine thing to do. I, I put sparkles in my hair and baubles in my hair and I thread ribbons through my hair and all sorts of really crazy stuff. That's a very feminine thing to be doing, isn't it? Well, there you go. There are parts of me that are feminine that I don't automatically hate. This is how I understand myself and embrace myself and accept myself. I don't think it would be necessarily a bad thing for that process to happen more in the trans community. I'm not saying that we should all just stop transitioning because this is better. I'm saying this is a useful tool. It helped me. Perhaps it will help you as well. And I've been rambling for an hour, although large parts of that have been breaking up cat fights and having coughing fits, so hopefully I can edit it down a bit. Um, I hope you are all in excellent health and having a wonderful a wonderful day. Happy New Year to everybody, and I will talk to you guys later.